welcome all of you. I am Paula Frangella, and I am <coughs> honored to be the president of CCASTD in 2013. Hey, you're, hey, you're, thanks for coming here, really. I, um, I flew in from Orlando this morning, and I have to say, boy, my arms are tired. Um, and I was on the Disney Magical Express this morning at about 4 a.m. I was at the Training Magazine conference all this week. Congratulations to the top, 20, the top 125 companies. Very nicely done. Um, and then also to the top 40 under 40, uh, the next round of uh, folks that have now um, won the uh, Trainer Award, which is a, a global award that recognizes it's very, very competitive, the top 40 under 40. Um, they've decided for this next round to get rid of the age requirements. And so what they're doing is uh, it could be one, it's peer nominated. So in order to win the top trainer award of a training magazine, um, you have to, it's peer nomination. It's a big celebration at the annual conference, which is usually either down in Florida or in California. So it's either like you know San Diego or Orlando, they alternate years. Um, it's a big deal. There are press releases and there's articles and stuff like that in Training Magazine. Uh, and they're removing the age. It'll have to, but you have to have no more than 10 years experience in this industry. So that's the, the limitation that they're putting in because people were cheating on their ages and they started carding people. <laughs> <laughs> started carding people. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting thing. Woo! So. Um, so anyway, so, you know, and, and everybody kept saying to me yesterday as I'm wandering around Florida, which for most of the trip they'll be happy to know was uh, kind of cold, um, but they were telling me, you know, did you know about the weather that's coming into Chicago? And I was like, no, stop, no, no, I don't, la, 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 I cannot hear you, I'm here in Florida, please do not harsh my mellow. So on the Magic Express this morning, I heard about Snowmageddon that's supposed to be coming this evening. So, we're gonna get the show on the road so you guys can get what it is that you need and get out. And I mean that with love and in the most polite way, yes. the most polite way possible. So we're gonna talk about game mechanics, otherwise known as gamification and in instructional design, when to use it, why to use it, how to use it. I want you to have context for it. I want you to have definitions for it. What is gamification? What are game mechanics? Why on earth would I ever want to do this? Um, how do I get started in doing this? And I've got some very practical tips and some very practical tools for all of you as well. Okay? Fair enough? Sound like you're kind of in the right place? All right, so the very first thing that I want you to do is those of you that have some sort of device, smartphone, laptop, iPad, tablet, whatever it is, get it out. We're going to use it. And if you don't have one, don't worry. I'm going to put people into uh, teams, into you're going to have a buddy. We're going to be able to play things together. So we're going to do, um, we can do games in learning. And I'm a big believer in modeling what good looks like, right? So we're not just going to talk about this stuff hands on. We want to actually start doing this stuff. And so that being said, we're going to do some games today in the analog world, right? So independent of technology. And then we're going to play some games that are dependent on technology. Uh, and usually it's technology agnostic, right? So it doesn't really matter what device you have on you. Um, and when you design for these types of activities, you don't always know what device somebody may have on him or her. So how do we design for that when we have this big unknown variable, right? So we're gonna we're gonna see how that works tonight. Woohoo! Hooray! So all right, and I know that we have a mix of experience here. We have a mix of experience. If you have a device, raise your hand. By a show of hands, if you have some kind of device to play along, okay. By a show of hands, um, if you have a device, do you have Wi-Fi access for DePaul tonight? Did you, get, did you sign the waiver downstairs? Sell off a firstborn child, probably one that's in college, needed to go anyways? Yes. Did you? OK, good. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody not have the not have one yet, not have the Wi-Fi? Yeah. I didn't sign off, I realized. OK. I did, but I don't have the device. But you, but you know what? It, it works without even doing anything. Yeah, yeah. You can hit it and you Does it come up? OK. All right, well then, fair enough. Thanks. Thanks for that. OK. I'm just getting a sense of who's got what, kind of where we're at as far as the connectivity is going to be. So that being said, 
What I would like you to do, activity number one starting, activity number one starting, please prepare to stand. Please stand. Without discussion with each other, without discussion with each other, what I'd like you to do is line up one long line in the front of the room. Those of you that have the least experience with gamification or game mechanics and instructional design, on up to those of you that feel you have the most experience in gamification and instructional design. So from least to most, without discussion, Bunnies, don't be furry. You know, telling training professionals, warning professionals, no discussion. It's like telling bunnies, don't be furry. Don't be fuzzy. Please don't be fuzzy. Wow, there's a lot going on over here. Can we stretch out a little bit? Can we stretch out a little bit? Everybody's a little more. I, I see the ton. Look at this down here. Oh, I don't want anybody to think. Okay. Can we fill that in a little bit? Fabulous, excellent, okay. All right. Sir, may I ask your name and your experience with game mechanics and instructional design? Uh, my name is Chris Rail, and I have no experience. I came from Okay, excellent, thank you, excellent. And then down here at the very, very end, who thinks that they have like probably negative numbers of experience. Like there's a deficit there already. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm gonna give everybody now that we kinda of know the points, follow what level of experience do you have with any I barely there? know the term. Okay. So are we on the is it, is it the Yeah, so I'm gonna give you a chance that if you feel like you need to reconfigure, because most experience here, least experience there, I'm gonna give you an opportunity now to reconfigure. You might be the cheese stands alone. I will. Cheese is right. So can you can you uh, give us your name and your experience with gamification or game mechanics and learning? Well, my name is Matt Elwell, and I use uh, improv games as the basis for our instructional design when we do soft skills training. So I. Think I have a lot of experience, unless you have, unless gamification is something different than using games and training. Okay, excellent. Thank right. you. Yes, that sounds like some experience. And Leslie, can you share with us too? Um, I'm Leslie Shapiro. I have just a tiny bit of experience. I would say I used to work for a company that did a lot of flash gaming, um, incorporated into the design. Um, I'm also actually a big gamer myself, so I'm always criticizing um, how games are designed and trying to picture how they. Could Okay. I think a lot about it. You think a lot about it. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then Tim? I am very similar to Leslie. Uh, I'm also a gamer nerd, and uh, I did I do it some Flash games for my company now, and uh, just I, I think a lot about you know, how gaming can help. I've got some best friends that are teachers and educators, and they all are ga gamers too, and they all believe in it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what I'd like for the three of you to do is just move away a little bit over here. <laughs> and can you face everybody here and then those of you here, can you look at them? Wave. Did you get their names? Can you recognize them on site now? Do you see them as resources that you can go to for additional help on, uh, on this? Excellent. Okay, fabulous. Thank you. All right, well made. Sit down. Thank you for coming along. And as you're coming back to your seats, as you're coming back to your seats, tell me a little bit, why are you here? Why did you risk snow, ice, sleet, a Chicago evening to venture out to Naperville and to, to come and do this, especially with so many people who are uninitiated in this? Why does this matter to you? Why do you, why do you care? Why are you here? Excellent. Anybody else? Who else? Yes. 
Yes, I've heard the term. We used it a little bit on my last project. Um, one to get gains into training, and then as it turns out, either none of us really knew how to do it, or never could figure out why, but never really happened. Okay. So, knowing more about the term and some of the things that you pointed out in terms of why, when, how. Okay, excellent. So tried to kind of move in this direction before and got a little stalled out. And how do we kind of get that show on the road? Excellent, thank you. We currently do gamification uh, for our, on the customer side to create loyalty programs. And so we're looking to uh, use games in training for engagement and, and uh, Leo, would you mind standing up for a moment? <laughs> Everybody see Leah? Ooh. Our company uses gamification for customer engagement. This is the way of the world. This is what's going to happen. This is one of the key reasons why it is that we need to learn how to do this because this is going to be, this is going to replace traditional advertising. This is going to replace traditional marketing. These are going to be the keys to the kingdom and how we engage our customers and our internal employees. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Thank you for standing up. Okay. Everybody can recognize her now, right? Yeah. Everybody's got this down? Great, thank you. And I've been doing the training of one for another, you know, forever. And I I do a lot of activities that are engaging and energizing, but I fall back on the same ones over and mm -hmm. over because I know them and I can pop them in, I can facilitate them in my sleep, and sometimes I do. Um, so it's just looking for new, exciting things, and I don't exactly know what it is, so, you know, I'm up for new things. Excellent, so up for new things. So know a little something, something about doing this. Know a lot of something about doing this. Looking for a little, looking for a new game to play. Okay, all right, excellent. Yeah, Mary Lou? Yeah, I'm looking for some ammunition to try to sell the concept to some of my peers. Ah, business case, yeah. Yeah, we've, you know, we integrated some games into some of our training and there's a resistance that our workforce doesn't like this, it's too silly. Or, you know, Especially the engineers or those IT yeah, people. Yeah, it's like it's got to be wasting their time. So I'm, just, you know, hoping that like a sponge, get something I can translate back. That's a great, yeah, that's a great point too, right? So then what's the need? How do we, how do we, you know, drive a little urgency around why we need this and then provide some data to make the case uh, to our peers and then also to management why we're doing these types of games. Excellent, okay, thank you. Terry? So I have a very young staff. And if I stand up in front of them one more time with PowerPoint presentation, I might get booed mm -hmm. and kicked out. And um, so I'm looking for ways that I can re-engage them and find an interesting way for them. And I'm looking at a company that is open to anything. So oh, great. Okay. I, I have the license to do what I need to do if I can afford it. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. So, and, and as I said, like with Leah, Leah or Leah? Leah. Leah. With Leah, it's starting with customer engagement and then it's going to come around internal as more and more of the millennials enter the workforce. Okay, as more and more millennials enter the workforce. Excellent. Thank you for sharing all of that. Let me share a little bit about a little bit about my background and why any of this matters to me. And then also start giving you some data that you can take in order to start making a case for why it is that we want to move in this particular direction. And then we're going to jump right in into a technology-based activity. And I'm going to show you how quick you can kind of turn one of these things around. OK? You ready? Anybody know who that is other than me? <laughs> Who's that? He is a robot. It's Bumblebee. It's Bumblebee. And what is Bumblebee? He's a transformer. He's a transformer. Transformer. He's your favorite transformer. What is a transformer? Something I can play with. That's right. Something you can play with. Something that starts out as an ordinary object. It's a cartoon object. character. Yeah. Something Sorry. that starts out as an ordinary object and then becomes almost a human or a character. Right? Like That's thus becomes a bumblebee or whatever. That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Um, Trish, uh, Transformers are an alien race from the planet Cybertron. <laughs> <laughs> They're divided into Autobots and Decepticons. <laughs> wow! Okay! That kind of, that kind of Transformer nerd. Alright! Everybody got a good look at Matt again. Alright. So Transformers, so they start out, right? 
right? I mean, they start out really, they look rather ordinary, and then they turn into these sort of superpower, superpower beings. And then this um, particular transformer named Bumblebee is down at the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. He's right there when you first walk in off the parking lot and go into the entrance hall is Bumblebee. And the reason why I have him on the screen is because we need to learn how to transform ourselves. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that Indianapolis Children's Museum is one of the best I've ever seen worldwide. And I've seen a lot of children's museums. They have nieces and nephews, and that's kind of their thing. So uh, this is an amazing place. And transformation is a lot of what we're going to talk about today as far as why it is that we need to move in this direction. So all right, it's a cool word. This is why. This starts out why. This is why this has meaning to me. Big, hairy, audacious goal. I have a big, hairy, audacious goal. And I'm one of those people that believes everybody should have a big, hairy, audacious goal. It doesn't have to be the same as mine. It doesn't have to even be near mine or look anything like mine. But I think that this is really what um, drives us in life. And so my big, hairy, audacious goal is this. To radically change learning and performance worldwide radically change learning and performance worldwide. And not just because I woke up one day and said, wow, I think I just really want to do that, but I think it's imperative that we get on the stick and get that done. They're going to replace us with bad technology. If we don't step up and learn how to perform in our organizations, I'm here to tell you, they're going to, place us, they're going to replace us with really bad technology, and it's going to be terrible, and it's not going to matter. It's going to be terrible, and it's not going to matter. So I'm on a mission. I am on a mission in order to get this done. So why transformation and not innovation? We hear all about innovation right now. Why transformation and not innovation? Innovation implies changing what is. Transformation is going to what's new. So we're creating what's new. We are in times that call for innovative ways to transform ourselves to create what's new. We are transforming the emerging profession of learning and performance. How many people here have worked in organizations before there were IT departments and these crazy computers on our desks? Okay. How many people don't want to admit to being in corporations before? <laughs> How many people took a typing class when they were in middle school? Right? I was just thinking about the other day. We don't do typing class in high school. We don't do, we don't do, typing, we don't do typing courses anymore, right? Um, so, you know, about 20 years ago, we didn't have IT departments, or we just started to get IT departments. IT did not exist as a profession. We have some technology, but we didn't have technology in the way that we think about a technology infrastructure today. And we didn't have chief technology officers or chief information officers, those roles did not exist. And IT, when it first started coming into the organization, it was kind of ad hoc. And I'm an IT professional by trade. I, I came up, I started out in training, I was an accidental trainer, and I started out as a software trainer. This was when Windows and DOS were first showing up in office environments, nobody knew how to use them, and I kind of had a knack for being able to not only figure out the technology, but then help other people understand how to do it. How many people accidental trainers, and then somehow you wound up in this profession and found out that you loved it, right? Because you didn't love it, you wouldn't be here tonight. So, all right, so then, um, so that being said, IT went from being ad hoc, and we can, we can talk about our IT brothers and sisters, they're going through their own challenges right now, I, I understand this, but um, now they have a seat at the table, right? That elusive, proverbial seat at the table. They have IT positions, like Don was talking about during the announcements. We have chief information officers and chief technology officers. Can you imagine an organization that would not have a technology infrastructure today and somebody strategically driving that initiative? Can you imagine that in any organization today? No. This is our future. We're about 15 years behind that same trajectory. So for those of us old enough, seasoned enough, experienced enough, fabulous enough, and those of us who are younger and don't actually have these memories, but have heard every once in a while about these tales, 
to have seen IT come up in the organization, this is our path forward as we continue to build people <coughs> infrastructure and as we do this shift from tangible assets, right, like equipment and widgets and all these other industrial age concepts and paradigms to really driving competitive differentiation on talent, on people. It's not just me transforming the industry, it's all of us transforming learning and performance in the 21st century. We have to get this done. We have to do it. Okay. Industrial age. When we talk about the industrial age, we think of things working like clockwork, right? Routine, discrete, easy tasks. Maybe not easy, but if you did X, then you produced Y. How many people get to work like that every day now? You walk in, the to-do list that you put together the night before is the to-do list that you get to do today. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? I mean, there, once upon a time, we actually, we could do that. There was actually some stability, right? There was some stability. Now, we're not talking about clockwork anymore. Clockwork, uh, that phrase is something that's really from the industrial age, right? It's thinking about organizations as machines. And machines being mechanical or no. They're sequential, they're linear. If I put this into effect, then these things happen as the particular outcomes. We don't work like that anymore. And the reason why? Because it's a VUCA world. VUCA, V-U-C-A, VUCA. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. This is from Bob Johansson. He's a futurist at the Institute for the Future. VUCA. And I'm here to tell you it's not going to stop. We keep going from states of chaos to order to chaos again, back to order. We get to like touch order for about 10 seconds and then we're off and running again. It's a VUCA world. Which means that all of that stuff that we would spend a lot of time putting into place now doesn't last. It changes. We now sooner deploy a new program, a new training program, or design something new and put it into the organization then something has changed. How many people have ever done instructional design on a new computer system or an upgrade? What kind of moving target is that? <laughs> I'm still designing, Trish. It's been seven years, right? We're at release K4C.21, or at least that's what the IT people tell me. This is the new normal. It's not going to stop. Okay, so the three C's that we have to be aware of. Complexity, chaos, and change. Things are getting more complex in our professional lives and in our personal lives, right? So, dealing with a lot at the office and we're dealing with a lot when we get home. Complex. Chaos. Chaos theory is now a business management tool. Chaos theory is something that comes from the physical and natural sciences they are now using to describe organizations. And chaos theory basically says that from chaos comes order and from order comes chaos. Right, so it flips, chaos order, chaos order. And it used to be an industrial age, it used to be like chaos, order, now it's like woo, woo, it's like woo, it's like one of those beanie propeller hats. And then change, right, change is a constant, change happens, we're in these constant states of shift. We no longer work with just the people that are in the four walls of the campus that we report to, right, so when I go into the office, and we don't just work with the people in our organization anymore. We partner many times with our suppliers. We partner many times with our customers. We partner many times even now with our competitors, right? It's beyond the four walls of the campus. And it's no longer about us being subject matter experts and delivering training or designing learning where we're delivering training. There's the democratization of information. <clears throat> People have access to information now like they never did before. We used to sort of control it, not because we were trying to control it, it was just the way that it was structured. There were people in the organization that had information. We needed them to share it with other people, right? We needed to get information out of other places. And one of the mechanisms to do that was through training, through training delivery. Now in our classes, we have people many times in the classes who know more about the subject matter that we are instructing or the design that we've given to the facilitator is instructing. There's expertise in the classroom beyond the sage on stage or the person in the front of the room. 
So we've shifted from less of that delivery of content to more of that facilitation style and trying to leverage the expertise and experience in the room. Because people have no problems accessing information. And so now we have to have a better understanding of the difference between instruction and information. Quick story, Allison Rossett, San Diego University, phenomenal person, especially in the learning technology space, she's one of the pioneers really in e-learning, uh, tells a story about the Coast Guard, about the US Coast Guard. US Coast Guard is responsible, the Coast Guard agents, the US Coast Guard agents are responsible for actually inspecting watercraft. There are 220 watercraft that they have to be able to inspect. And it's, you know, we're talking about little dinghies up to yachts, to ships, to, you know, you know, to all sorts of different watercraft that are out there, 220. So separation of information from instruction. What's important is for them to internalize and learn through instruction the process for completing an inspection. What they can tap into information is particulars about that type of ship, regardless of what type of vessel they're on. And so in the training that Allison talks about, working with the Coast Guard that they put together, is that the training became instruction on how to do the inspection process, and information became a job aid on a handheld device so that they go, okay, well, I'm standing on an XYZ kind of ship, and they'd be able to look up the particulars that they needed with just-in-time information. It is not about information anymore. Information is freely available. It's about helping people connect with a context for that information so that it goes from information to knowledge. And knowledge is something that we can actually put into use. It's something that we can apply to resolving some kind of a situation. So we've got all this chaos. And we've got now this shift from thinking about organizations as clockwork and thinking them more as dynamic and ecosystems where things are constantly shifting and we know that one of the major shifts that's happening right now is they're saying that by 2014, more than half of the workforce will turn over and it will be the millennials. <coughs> more than half of the workforce will turn over by 2014 and it will be the millennials, Generation Y. Not the Gen Xers, not one of the older Gen Xers, but Generation Y. And as some of the comments in the room were, these are not people that came up going to you know eight hours of training. These are kids that in some cases went to school, they went to university, they were able to listen to you know lectures uh, as podcasts and be able to walk around with them as MP3 devices. They have learned their educational experience, their academic experience is different than what we've experienced. And so the question that people come to me with all the time is, well just because the kids like to play games, does that mean that we have to serve them? Yes. <laughs> yes. And here's why. So, all right, so 47% of the workforce in 2014 will be millennials. Millennials are born between 1977 and 1997. 1977 and 1997. And it's not about our just catering to them. It's because this is how their world's going to be. As we keep going through the three C's, complexity, chaos, and change, some of the things that we've seen on the surface, that tip of the iceberg, some of the organizational issues, the people issues, some of the things that perhaps we haven't dealt with, not just us as profession, but organizations haven't necessarily dealt with, all this stuff below the water level, this is what they're inheriting. But that's, the things that we see up at the top here, where we can train on because we know about them, but below the waterline, and look how much is below the waterline, people's attitudes, their mental models, right? They're fit to the organization. The structures that are in place to support them or not support them, things that hinder or help them in their particular success. These are the things that we're starting to have to deal with now, right? We're starting to have to deal with now, and these kids, as they're gonna come in, will continue to do this, and this is gonna get worse and worse until we figure out that there's more than one hammer in the toolkit of training. But training isn't the only intervention that's out there. There are multiple disciplines out there. There are multiple uh, tools that we can use. We can use coaching, we can use mentoring, we can use stretch assignments, we can do job rotation. There's many different things. We're no longer designing training programs. We're designing learning programs, right? It's a suite of multidisciplinary 
uh, solutions that are helping drive some kind of organizational outcome and success. All right, so what does this have to do with gaming? According to the ASD annual report, this is the latest report that just came out in December, we just here in the United States spend over $152 billion a year annually. Organizations spend 150, 156, sorry, $0.2 billion a year annually on training, and part of that is our salaries. How do we earn our key? We have to help them make this shift. We have to help make these shifts. And so the industrial age metrics, what's in seats, number of courses developed over a period of time, how many courses did we develop, how many courses did we deliver, how many people participated in the audience, it doesn't matter anymore. If you're not driving, if you're not changing some kind of business result in the organization, you're not doing the right things. I stood in a training magazine at the conference, this is nothing I stood up and was like, stop it, start kicking people in the butt. We need to get on the stick here. If you're not aligned to business results, you're not doing the right things. Bob Pike talks about the Kirkpatrick four levels of evaluation, right? Level one is what? What's level one in Kirkpatrick? Reaction, learner, opinion, right? Bob calls it, did they like it? All right, level one, did they like it? Level two, what is level two? Did they learn it? Right, did learning occur? We can do a pre and post test, those types of things. What's level three? Transfer and learning to the job. Behavior, we want to be able to see that they took whatever happened in the training, right? So Bob Pike would call that, can they do it? What's number four? Result. The results, and Bob's thing is, does it matter? Does it make a difference? Right? Does it matter? And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves in these programs that we put together. Does it make a difference? So let me show you how gaming makes a difference. Starting with, if we're not getting in on the solutions here, then we're contributing to the problem. All right, so what do we do? Um, we exist in the organization, whether we're facilitators, instructional designers, we do executive coaching, if we manage a learning function, we exist to drive performance. If we help other people perform better than, and they align to organizational outcomes and strategy, then we're advancing the organizations forward. And then everybody wins, right? Everybody has jobs, the organizations are successful, people like what they do because they feel like they know what they're supposed to do, they have the capability to do it, right? And so uh, it takes us into the American Society for Training and Development's ASCD's mission statement. It's a play on words. Through exceptional learning and performance, we create a world that works better. Right? Play on words. We create a world that works better. Okay. All right. Models that we have in order to light the way of where we need to go, the roadmap for moving forward, we know what our professional competencies need to be. AFCD has got a model for it. Whether you ever become CPLP certified or not is irrelevant. What we need to do is align to a professional standard. We need to have an understanding. All right, gentlemen, close your ears for a moment. The woman who waxes my eyebrows has to be licensed in the state of Illinois. <laughs> right? We're not held accountable to a professional standard. We're still at a point in our emerging profession, think of IT. We're still at a point where we're not held accountable. It's voluntary at this point to raise our hands and say, yep, hold me accountable to professional standard. And if you don't like ASD's competency model, look at what they're doing in Singapore. Look at what they're doing in Australia. Look at what they're doing in other parts of the world. But adopt one. Find something. And this, as a matter of fact, this competency model now for ASD, the areas of expertise here, so the professional competencies as well as the foundational competencies, is recognized by the U.S. Department of Labor as the professional standard here in the United States. Let me say that again. The U.S. Department of Labor now recognizes this competency model as the professional standard in the United States, which makes us eligible for a whole bunch of things, including federal funding, especially for people in transition. So foundational competencies, interpersonal business management, and personal skills are things that we have to work on. And the nine areas of expertise are things that we have to work on. We've got a new competency model that just got published in January that goes into effect as far as the uh, certification is concerned at the beginning of next year. They're socializing. How much of it is different? About 80% stays the same. 
I'll tell you this, they're not getting rid of Kirkpatrick anytime soon, right? We haven't gotten good at it, right? We still haven't gotten good at it. So, okay. So who can we turn to as we go through all of these changes as masters in this space with uh, being able to introduce the concept of play? The concept of play? Lou Russell. Lou Russell wrote the Accelerated Learning Handbook back in the 1990s. Accelerated Learning. How do we use color? How do we use music? How do we use concepts of team development, team building, competition? When I talk about game mechanics, I'm not talking about anything different than things that we've done growing up playing board games, either with our parents, with our siblings, board games that we played with our kids, video games that we played, sports that we've played, game mechanics. We know game mechanics. Accelerated learning. Lou does this whole, um, you build rockets with popsicle sticks, right? And you learn a lot about communication, you learn a lot about teaming, you learn a lot, you know, just through that kind of an activity. We've also got now Carl Cap. I just saw Carl and I saw Jane actually down at Training Magazine. Carl's got a fabulous book called The Gamification of Learning and Instruction. And he's making the circuit. We'll be at the International Conference. Carl's book, Gamification, sold out. You couldn't get it on day two of the conference. It was gone by the first day. There were about 3,000 people at the conference. It was gone. Jane's book, same. Jane's got a book, uh, Social Media for Trainers by Jane Bozard, also a way of how do we introduce these activities. I don't work for either one of them, but Jane did actually tweet this morning. She was like, thanks, Trish, I'm going to send a check. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's practice. Ready? Okay. Okay. All right. Two industry drivers right now. Technology. How many people here have their world rocked by technology constantly? I can't even keep up anymore. I really hate admitting that, but I can't keep up anymore with what's happening with technology. Um, and then uh, new design techniques, right? We've got, how many people have heard about Michael Allen and Richard Seitz's new book, Leaving Addy for Sam? Yeah. Yeah. We're breaking up with Addy? I don't know. We are breaking up. Well, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a total loss. We get, to, we get to visit with Addy, according to the book, <laughs> but it's appropriate when it's appropriate, but there are some new models out there. And actually what Richard and Michael have found with that is, we've actually been doing SAM for a while, but we've basically what we've done is hacked Addy. We're not doing true Addy anymore. We basically started doing whatever worked, and then we still call it Addy. Um, but that's for another presentation. All right, so new design techniques. So two industry drivers. We've got technology, we've got new design techniques. Let's go ahead. And we're going to use technology in order to build community and crowdsource solutions to real world problems. <coughs> so you're going to use technology right now in this room with what you have in your hands or with what somebody else in the room has in his or her hands in order to be able to crowdsource a problem. So at the same time that we're running this session here in this room today, Joey Marshall, who's on the board of directors, she's our vice president of marketing for CCSD, is on Facebook and Twitter, and has actually been engaging other learning and performance professionals in order to do this. So we're going to use this concept of crowdsourcing. Anybody, definition of crowdsourcing? What's crowdsourcing? What does that mean? Miriam? Getting consensus on some information about something. Kind of, not necessarily consensus. Has anybody read The Wisdom of Crowds? The Wisdom of Crowds is a really good book called The Wisdom of Crowds. And what they have found through research is nothing. Oh, do you remember that game, One Versus 100? One Versus 100, where they had like the 100 people up that were like the experts on things. And you had the one person playing the game. It's a, it's a TV show. It's a game. Um, but basically what they found in The Wisdom of Crowds is if you sample the general population, you came up with a better solution to things than if you put together a panel of experts. <laughs> because a panel of experts think about things in a specific way. Because that's what being an expert is. We have experience. But when you do that sampling and broaden that out, so when you crowdsource something, you're going, okay, guys, let's just take a random sampling of a particular population and let's talk about some problems and let's see if we can come up with some solutions for them. They are, there's a TED Talk. How many people here know what TED is? TED? T-E-D, TED, TED Talk? 
Uh, TED.com, fabulous uh, place to go. TED stands for Technology, Education, and Design. Used to be a think tank that was out in California that was like closed. They would get all these big thinkers in around the world and have these conversations in February every year and they talk about technology, education, and design. Now they've opened it up so that we have visibility into those talks. TED Talks are famous for being 17 minutes or less. You have to give the story of your life, the presentation of your life in 17 minutes or less. It's a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous resource. One of the TED Talk presentations that's out there is about how they're now using video games. They're getting kids to play video games that solve social responsibility problems, social issues. How do we end hunger? How do we do things around uh, energy conservation? Kids, kids, eighth graders, and younger. They're crowdsourcing, and they're using the technology that the kids know how to do. They know how to work a controller in their hands, and they're playing a game, and they're solving problems, because that's what you learn how to do when you play a game. You learn how to work within the context of that game. OK, so we're going to crowdsource. We're going to use technology. And the technology that we're going to use specifically is called Evernote. Now, you do not need to have this installed on your machine. We're going to use a public Evernote notebook that I already set up previous to today. Evernote is a free tool. Free. There is a premium version of it if you want to do some extra things with it. The premium version now is like, I don't know, $45 for the year. When you see an elephant, what do you think of an elephant? Memory. Accelerated learning. You're using an icon. They used an icon that we all go, oh, wait a minute, never forget, right? If I put something in my Evernote, I'll never forget. Here's the thing about Evernote. Evernote is not only free, Evernote is also free and it comes on multiple platforms. Meaning, you can download it for Android, you can download it for iPhone, you can put it on your iPad, you can put it on your laptop, you can put it on your Windows laptop, you can put it on your MacBook. You can put it on your tablet, right? You can put it on all these different devices. It's kind of device agnostic. And the reason why that's cool is those devices become windows into the same notebooks that you keep in Evernote. So if I'm standing in the grocery store shopping and all I have on me is my iPhone, I can access all of my notes in Evernote for my iPhone and add things. If I'm at home or at the office working on my laptop, I can access the same information in my Evernote. I can also access Evernote on the web. I can be at somebody's house, I can go visit Sarah, get out of Peoria, log in on the browser, be able to access all of my Evernote stuff. What kind of stuff can you access? You can access text, you can put text in your Evernote, you can put audio files in your Evernote, you can put video files in your Evernote. The only time that you pay premium, if you want premium, it's 40, like I said, it's like $45 for the year to put in file attachments like PDFs or Word documents or those types of things. You can squirrel those away in Evernote too. I heart that from I heart Evernote too. Okay, so what we're gonna do with Evernote is we're gonna collect a bunch of media right now, right here and we're going to put it into the Evernote folder. So not only in this public folder can you, can you all, without me having to run around and ask you a username and a password and all that kind of stuff, you can put media into it. You can also view the media that's been contributed. So what it becomes is this centralized repository, this folder that we can use in order to crowdsource. If we ask people a question, instead of talking about leadership, why don't you have people in the room interview each other to talk about leadership and contribute it to a centralized folder and then debrief what it is that people contributed? You can have people just do something simple like go out on the internet and find a photo that represents leadership to you and put it in the folder and then talk about the media that shows up. So this is exactly what we're going to do. Let me show you what the um, Evernote folder looks like right now. Because again, Joey's been out there getting people to already kind of load things up, because everybody all over the world has access to this. Now, you're going to see this when you go to the link to view. So we're going to do two different things. There's putting media in, which is going to happen through email. So if you want to contribute something, and you will, you're going to do it through email. And when you want to look at something on your device, I'm going to give you the web address. 
You're going to be able to go here to the public folder and view. You don't have to join. If you don't have to join, then according to the dialog box that's on the screen, what do you have to do? Yeah. Say it louder. Yeah. Like you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So if I just do view notebook, I can see this media, and I can see people contributing all sorts of different media. Okay. That answers the questions that I'm about to give you. All right, you with me? Yes. All right. So you first have to go to our email. So the first thing you're going to do is exactly this. Give me one second here. I'm going to get us back into the PowerPoint. So you to, bless you. I've got the directions up on the screen. OK. First thing you're going to do is you're going to pick one. I'm going to have you get together into small groups. I'm going to have you pick one to talk about. Either how do you operate as a proactive business partner within your organization? As a learning professional, how do you partner with the business? That's question number one. And you can answer either or, right? You can answer either or, and you can ask either or. So the deal is you're going to interview somebody else in the room. And if you want to know how do they partner with the business and the organization, then you're going to interview somebody on that concept. And then the other question is, the second question is, alternatively, how do they demonstrate value? Not prove value, how do they demonstrate value? How do they do value, not know value, do value, perform and deliver on value within the organization? Right, so pick one, pick one, and you're gonna interview somebody else in the room. But actually, you know what, I'm not gonna put you in groups. I'm just gonna let you, I'm gonna let you kind of do a free flow. All right, you get to interview anybody in the room that you wanna do, if you want to talk to. Okay. So pick one of the questions or concepts to focus on. Remember which number it is, okay, if it's number one or number two, because you're gonna you're gonna actually put that, you're gonna actually put that in the in the subject line of the email. Okay, number one or number two. So pick one, interview someone else in the room about how they're addressing this particular area, ask them to share any tips with you. Now, be creative. How many people, so on most smartphones today, we have voice memos. So in the room right now, you can do an audio interview. You can record the audio of the interview. You can do text, you can type things up. You can also write things. You're, you may certainly come up and use the flip chart. You can write on the whiteboard. Just don't mix up the markers. You can write on your pads of paper this another thing and then take a picture of it and submit a picture of what it is that you've written. Be creative in how you capture the media of what happens. You can also do video, right? So if you'd rather shoot a little you know, video using your smartphone or using your iPad or using your tablet or whatever it is that you have, you're welcome to do any of those things. If you've never done that with the device that you have before, learn how to do it today. I'm telling you there's somebody in the room who knows how to figure it out. What you're then going to do, and I'll give you the details in a moment, is you're going to email the media directly. What you can do is when I give you this email address, you're going to be able to just attach the media to that email, send it, and it's going to go in my Evernote folder. How cool is that? There. It's cool. Okay? And this is what you do in a room like this. You say, okay, guys, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to work on this activity. We're going to talk about this topic. Right? How do we how do we do this? So what does leadership what do these things look like to you? And then you give them an Evernote folder so that you can compile all of this and then debrief the contents of that folder. Now, here's how it works. This is how it organizes. This is how it organizes. When you write the email message, when you write the email message in the subject line, how many people know where the subject line in an email message is? <laughs> See how easy it is already? Right? We've been doing it for like 20 years now, right? <laughs> When you do it, you're going to reference the notebook. So there's a specific name. I'm having you put it all in one notebook. And that notebook is very cleverly known as CCHTD 2013. CCHTD 2013. And the way that you tell it in the subject line that CCASTD 2013-2013 is a notebook is you put the at symbol right before it. So in the subject line of the email, you're going to put at CCASTD 2013. Just before that, you're going to put which question you're answering. And you can just do it by one or two, right? So you can you can put one or two. And I'll give you 
more instructions here in a moment where what I'm telling you is written out. All right. So create an email. You're going to actually do the activity first, interview somebody, collect the media, and you're going to attach it to an email message. You're going to reference the notebook at CCSD 2013 in the subject line. Okay? You're going to title your contribution with your area of focus by using partner or value, or you can use number one or number two, either. You can put number one, or you can put partner, you can put number two, or you can put value. And actually, I'm going to have you switch these two around. Start with this in the subject line, put the question that you're answering in here first, and then put the at CCACD2013. And then you're going to tag your contribution with your first name by using pound sign, the number symbol, and then your name. Not your name, but your name. <laughs> like pound Trish. Not like pound Trish, like pound <laughs> Trish. People go, well, you're coming up with these hashtags, right? How do, who gets to decide who the hashtags are? You get to decide who the hashtags are. That's a hashtag. It's a hashtag. It just says, hey, I want all of the Trish stuff to be associated with Trish. Pound Trish. But your name, not mine. And then you're going to address the email to this crazy email address that's over here, which is going to make you get up from your seat anyways to take a look at this. Okay? So you're going to do these things. Make sure you put the question that you're answering first and then the folder. I apologize that I'm a little out of order there. Tag it with your name and send it to this email address. Okay? I'm going to put the two questions that I had up back up again for a second and then I'll switch the monitor as you guys get going back to this so you have the detailed instructions. You ready to talk to somebody? Let's go. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. 10 minutes to interview and be So the message is here. How many people learned something new about a device that they've had for a while and didn't know that thing existed? <laughs> right? Did we spend seven hours talking about it? No. 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 Did you have to go to a training class? No. no. You. What happened? Yeah. You, you did it. Why did you do it? Because yeah, I, I had to. I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> I wanted to try something new. You had a reason. Whose theory is that? Come on, masters. Hobby <laughs> bowl. Who is it? <laughs> Malcolm. No. no. Yes, Edgar got Yes, we learn when it's relevant, right? When we've got a need to learn something, we're pretty motivated. You don't have to get people to be motivated. You don't have to cajole them. You don't have to bribe them. You don't have to punish them into it. When people have a need to learn something, they learn things pretty quickly. They figure it out. So give them learning opportunities where they get to figure it out, right? Give them a need and then give them a, you know, an environment that lets them figure it out. I think that because the technology and information is so readily available that the brains are actually changing and rote memorization areas that were developed based on that are no longer going to be there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Do you know, all right, so here's, here's something for you as far as, as far as case information. And I will share the PowerPoint deck with you. There's many more slides to this that we'll have time to get to tonight unless you want to stay through snowmageddon, but because uh, I'm just kind of here. I live right up the street. Um, all the same to me. Uh, but this is exactly right. So, uh, and I've got the research paper actually referenced in this. Our IQ scores have gotten better since World War II, globally. You know why? In part because of the video games that the kids are playing. So what we're telling the kids, quit doing that, you're rocking brains, get away from the game. <laughs> They're actually learning, and they're learning in a new way, and it's lighting up, it's changing. What has changed about um, brain research in the past 10 years? How many people remember the egg in a frying pan commercials in the 1980s? Oh, yeah. Right? We thought the brain was static. We thought the brain was static, that if you kill off a bunch of brain cells, like that was it. Like, cyanora, this is your brain, this is your brain after drugs. Right? Remember the fried egg? Now we know this concept of plasticity. In neuroscience, in the brain research, we know about plasticity. Anybody know what plasticity is? What is it, Paul? If your brain needs to make a change for the better to help you, it will. 
kind what it of. Does, it actually, it'll switch between the two hemispheres. If there's a part of the one hemisphere that gets destroyed, like by a stroke, that's right. Say in the speech, it'll find a place on the other side and make it work. And we actually, that's exactly right, Paul. So we learn yeah. oftentimes from illness and disease or trauma that many times the brain, not always, but many times another part of the brain that wasn't responsible for that activity, talking or walking or some kind of uh, activity that or language, it'll pick it up, right? It'll compensate for an area that's been damaged. And we learn this concept of plasticity. We now know that the brain is dynamic and the brain changes according to the stimuli that it's around. And it changes physically. It literally physically changes. The synopses, the, the neuro network actually reconfigures based on the stimuli. We now know this is why addiction is so hard to get past. We are building ruts in our brains with everything. We are literally building patterns, physical patterns in our brains. And that's why some things are very hard to get past. Because you literally have to be exposed to other stimuli that then forces the brain to reconfigure in new ways. Plasticity, neuroscience. So this stimuli that these kids have now gotten from playing these video games has exactly done this. It's physically changed their brains. They are getting wired in a new way that's different than how we were wired. And some of us have that exposure, but not all of us, because we're just not in that same stimulated environment as they are. But there are hand coordination, the critical thinking skills, I think my oldest of the kids, of the nephews, of the nieces, he's 20. He plays Halo all the time. You know, he plays Halo all the time. But the kid's got reaction skills, you know, that you used to not be able to learn unless you were in the military. Or unless you did some kind of sport that demanded that kind of physical discipline of mind, body, and spirit, right? You have to have the, you know, he's focused. You don't have to teach him how to be focused and play Halo. I don't have to teach him, I don't have to teach him the physicality of Halo. I don't have to teach him the rules. He's motivated, self-motivated to go and learn. So if you give people a context. All right. In this particular case, and I'm going to show you what we came up with here. Let me show you what we came up with here. I'm going to go to the installed desktop version of Evernote and sync it. See, look. Look how it's coming into the folder. Now, this is the desktop. This is installed on my laptop. I'm going to show you the public folder in the, in the internet browser in just a moment, in Firefox in just a moment. But these are now starting to come in. And don't worry if you don't see yours. It's OK. But um, and it's just in the list view. So it came in. Here's the title. And what it did, you see the folder or notebook that I have selected? CCSD 2013, yeah? And it's blue because it's publicly shared, whereas these other green ones are private. So you can have a mix in your Evernote account. This is the premium account. The free account for Evernote looks pretty much the same. It looks just like this. So now I can see a timestamp. And then I can see, like Jan, named hers Q1 for question one, and then pound sign Jan, right? Now why does this matter? Because you can search on all those hashtags. So if I want to see everything that Jan contributed, I can just put in the search, here's my search up here, what would I type in to find all of Jan's contributions? Hashtag, hashtag Jan. Jan. That's all the purpose of the hashtag search. I don't care if you're using Evernote or if you're using Twitter, a hashtag just ties everything. It's sort of a new way of organizing or categorizing things on a fly, on the fly. So we're not limited to that hierarchical structure of folders and subfolders. We can do that and also be able to because I can have hashtag Jan tags of notes in other folders. So if I wanted to do a global search across all of my Evernote in all of my notebooks to find all the stuff that I got from Jan, I can search just on hashtag Jan and find all of that. That's the purpose of tagging. And tagging is something that you'll hear about, again, in Twitter as well as in Evernote. Okay. So let's take a look at the public folder. I want to show you the public folder. So I'm going to go in the browser. In this case, I'm using Firefox. Now, when you play with this, you're going to see that it looks like what we were looking at before we started this activity. And the reason being is I have to refresh the browser. What does refresh the browser mean? 
I have to reload it. I have to force it. Sometimes we hit F5. Sometimes, in this case, it's Firefox, so I'm going to do right click and reload. And I'm going to say, hey, Firefox, go check again. I'm going to hit View Notebook. And then now, look at all the new stuff that came in. And here's Jan's new thing, right? With a nice photo. Okay, we got a nice photo, so we can have a mix of media in here. I can also pop this out. So now we're looking at it in the split pane. I can also pop it out, pop it out into its own window. I can do this. Okay, so it talks about you know the um, the basics of uh, the basis of relationships, um, becoming a successful business partner within the organization. It comes with a picture and then it comes with some notes. I'm going to close this little window, close this note, and take a look at another one. So we've got um, technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with Tim, right? So putting this together. All right, nice. Just did this on the fly. <laughs> Just did this on the fly. Wait, what do they say about a picture? A picture is what? A thousand words. words. So instead of talking about concepts that we're talking about, like leadership and that kind of stuff, why don't we just use pictures? Hey, you mean find a picture of you know what this means to you. Okay. In this particular case, um, so we've got a, a we might need a plug-in here for this particular uh, media. Veronica, what is this? Is it a is oh, it an audio it's file? It's an audio file. It's an audio file. And you I could click on install plugin. It just depends on the device that she had. It needs the right driver. What's a driver? What a print let me take this. What are print drivers? Interface computer. Yeah, it's a thing that goes, hey computer, I want you to get to know this little printer over here. I'm gonna want to print to it at some point in my existence. I'd appreciate it if you installed this driver, which should let you talk to the printer, and it's all a driver is. Is it's a way of being able to have the computer recognize another technology and actually then utilize it. So sometimes you have to, depending on the technology that was used, you have to install a driver. We're not going to do that right now, but I just want to show you. Um, and then the same thing too. So beyond here, see, and it's got install missing plugins up at the top of the screen as well. When you leave here today, I'm going to keep this folder going. I'm going to keep the folder going so that you can, from your um, any whatever device you've got that can access the web like this, you can go into Firefox or Safari or Internet Explorer. You'll be able to go to this folder and be able to see all the media that people contributed. I'll give you the folder address, the, the web address, in just a minute here. Um, okay. So, and then you can see we've got different, you know, we've got different hashtags here, different types of media that were being used, right? All happening here in the room. Now, let's talk about the gamification side. This wasn't really a game. What could we do in order to make this a game? What are some elements that we could, that I could design into this activity that would make it a game? Yeah? Scavenger hunt. What would happen on a scavenger hunt? Go find this, take a picture of it. Yes, go find this, take a picture of this. You only need to do scavenger hunts just in a physical environment. I used to do, um, I've designed scavenger hunts for onboarding programs, right? Have them run around the organization, go talk to you know the mean person that does petty cash at accounting. Everybody's got the mean person at the petty cash when they're at accounting. And she's not so mean if you get to know her in onboarding and she thinks you're a cute millennial that just came in as an on-campus because she reminds you of she, you remind her of her grandson. <laughs> she said, all right, well go talk to her, right? You know, go establish a relationship with that guy in IT that you're going to have to talk to for the next 10 years of your life in order to get that print driver to actually work with that laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go and be on a scavenger hunt and actually go talk to them early before there's a pressure cooker situation, yeah. right? Scavenger hunt. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the scavenger hunt? When we play a scavenger hunt, what game mechanics happen? There are rules and rewards. Excellent. There are rules and rewards. What are rewards that they get in a scavenger hunt? What do we what do we get as a reward in a scavenger hunt? Finding. Finding. Sometimes we actually get something physical. We might get a prize. 
she might give us a lollipop when we go and visit her at the petty cash window in the accounting department. We might actually get a prize when we go there, but then also as a reward in a scavenger hunt, there's that sense of completion, right? When you complete one of the clues or missions in a scavenger hunt, we as human beings like to complete things. Completing tasks or completing missions or completing activities? Following directions. Well, but, well, in following directions, yes, but completion, game mechanic. That's a game mechanic. So when I'm talking about a game mechanic, I'm talking about things that we already know, we just haven't thought about it as a game mechanic before. So completing a mission, completing an activity, that sense of accomplishment, game mechanic. Crystal. You could also have two teams. What happens in a team? Competition. Competition is a huge game mechanic, right? Also, also working. Working together is a game mechanic, right? Driving the collaboration. Have you guys ever set up an activity where they have an aha moment, you get two teams or more pitted against each other and they learn through the experience that they really need to work together in order to complete the activity successful? So you don't have to tell them, hey guys, I'm gonna teach you about collaboration today. Throw them into it, right? Throw them into it, have that experiential learning. There's a model for experiential learning. Anybody know what the experiential learning model is? What's the first step that happens in experiential learning? Try. Ah, experience. So what about a situation where they get to experience things? What happens after the experience? We could, we could revise or improve, but what do we do after an activity? We usually do what? Reflection and a debrief, right? So we go, okay, you just had this experience, let's debrief it, because you want to be deliberate on those points. So the intro to an activity, very important, right? Set up people's expectations, help them be successful in doing that activity. The second thing is then, you know, as you do the intro and then put them into the activity so they're experiencing it, now you do the debrief, and then you do what? After we debrief, we want to tie it back, right? We want to tie it back to some kind of application to what it is that they do. Experiential learning, there's a framework for it. So competition, collaboration, sense of accomplishment, rewards. Tell me other game mechanics. Tell me a little more about that. Once you master the Ding, 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 yes. Yes, two game mechanics listed there. Thank you very much. One is mastery. If you've ever seen any of Dan Pink's stuff, he talks about that as one of the intrinsic motivators that we have, is we like to master something. We'd like to master our desks. We'd like to master our to-do lists. We'd like to master our to you know, I mean, we would like some sense of mastery. Please, could you let me just kind of do this for a while and get good at it instead of going off to the next thing? We like mastery. <laughs> The second thing is, is that after we master something, we hunger for challenges, and in a game that's called leveling up. Remember Mario Brothers, play Mario Brothers, right? After you complete that level, you get to go to the next level. There's that sense of accomplishment. I got it first, na 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 na. I got to the, we used to, my sister and I, when we were, uh, oh geez, I was 13 and she was 11, and we just moved from New York to New Jersey, and we didn't know anybody. And uh, we were gaming geeks, and we would sit and play these adventure games, text-based adventure games. We didn't play the stuff later when the graphics came out. We played the text-based, mm -hmm. you know, I go back to playing Zork and Ultima and those kinds of games. And we had a lot of fun because you, you know, you had to think things through. My dad would come home from work, and we would have spent, you know, 16 hours at the computer that day on a Saturday, and we'd be like, well, you know, we found the frog with the screwdriver in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was playing, too. We had a character that was playing in the game, too. He was like, what frog or what screwdriver? And we're like, well, you need the screwdriver when you go talk to the witch. What's the witch? Well, that's what you get. And he was like, what? And then, you know, he would spend hours and be very tired when he went to work the next day. <laughs> Level up, right? You advance. There's advancement in the game. So, game mechanics. All right, yes? I think the one that hasn't been mentioned yet, we've got the carrot. We didn't have to talk about the stick. Yes! What happens with the stick? You get punished if you screw up. You get punished you if die. you screw up, you die! <laughs> right? These kids are playing characters. You know, bum, bum, bum. You 
you didn't meet the frog in the woods with the screwdriver and you went to go see the witch, she not only didn't give you the thing that was going to have you level up, she took you out. Right? You, there's a consequence, right? So there, there's both the stick and the carrot. Sometimes they lose points, sometimes they lose characters. You know, in any game, so there's, a, there's a consequence to it. Yeah, excellent, very, very good. So here's the definition of gamification. Just leveraging game mechanics within our instructional design. We already do it. How many people have used competition before? You have activities where you're pitting them against each other. Right? So then you don't have to stand there and like crack the whip. You're already, there's a consequence already. And as a matter of fact, in that one, that photo that I showed you of Lou with the popsicle sticks and the rockets, we actually use competition to, um, as a red herring. Right? We make them think that the expectation is one thing and then we pull the rug out from underneath them. They think they're competing for something and then we go, nope. So how could we have made this a game? How could we have gamified this? How could I have gamified this? I could have done what? Divided, teams. Divided you into teams. Mm -hmm. Points. Com competition, we could use time as the incentive. That's exactly right. What else could we use? Points. Following directions, right? We could use points, right? The number of missions, right? The number of missions completed. Creativity. Like some kind of injection terms that the most creative time. That's exactly right. This is exactly right. We can do peer review. You don't even have to go out and get a panel of judges. You can do by vote in the room, right? You can put all this stuff together and like say, you know, okay, go out and complete this particular mission and who had the best interview, go through and do a debrief of the interviews and then by show of hands. Right? We don't have to make this difficult. We don't have to make it difficult. We don't have to make it particularly hard. What else could I have done to gamify this? You can reward the team that uses the most different, the most different numbers of media. Yes, we can do rewards, right? So think about it. This is one of the things that we have a challenge with in our profession. We know what bad performance looks like, but how often do we get clear on what good performance looks like, right? And then there's that whole thing about rewarding good performance. So if my outcome that I want for this is for you guys to be better at a particular technology or you know, a series of technologies, then am I doing something that rewards you for using the various media? And then how can you, again, put that into different games? Put that into different games. And this goes back to looking at Leah right now. This is the other thing that's happening. Here's another reason why it is that we need to start learning how to put this stuff in. How many people have ever heard of Foursquare? <laughs> Just checked in. Right. What do you get from playing Foursquare? What do you, it, mayor, it's a mayor, game. Mayor. <laughs> you, get, you get what? You can become a mayor. You can become a mayor because you've checked in to that location <laughs> very often. That's right, you're a mayor of four places. Why do you like being mayor of four places? I get discounts sometimes. You, get, you, get, you do, you get discounts. Okay, so how many people don't know what Foursquare is? You've never seen it, never heard of it, you don't really know what it is. Could you explain what Foursquare is, please? Would you mind standing up? Oh, my fellow. Um, Foursquare, and uh, mine's connected to Facebook, really all you do is um, check into places. So for instance, when we got here, we checked in that we were here at DePaul University at, at a CCA. SDD um, event, and I checked in Pat, Leah, and Ashley, and it's just fun, but it's posted on my Facebook page, and also my friends can see where I'm at, so it's a little bit of a competition, so I have about, I think, 40 friends, and it ranks you also like a leaderboard, so based on all the places you check into, you get points. That's exactly it. Thank you. So leaderboards, letting people see the competition, right? Where do I rank? So they not only, you're not only using competition like they know they're competing, but you're showing them a leaderboard. Hey guys, you're number three. You might want to get on the stick. Mary Ann. Yeah. Um, it's not only points. Because points, what else? they're kind of fun between your friends, but you can go to like Chili's or something, and they'll say, if you check in here, then you'll get free chips and salsa, which I think it might be free now anyway. But then you check in with at least three friends, then you get a different thing for free. And there's different specials, and if you are the mayor at this one place, I can't remember what it was, but they gave you a free t-shirt that says that you're the mayor, if you actually are the mayor. Or if you check in a certain amount of times, they have like loyalty rewards, like you're here every fifth time, you get a discount. So there are some things to be the mayor. Not that I'm the mayor of anything. 
So what does it do for Chili's restaurants? So if you're a restaurant owner and you're having people check in and you're rewarding them for bringing their friends and their families so that you all check in at the same time, what is that doing for their business? Business. You can get five business. Advertising. It's free. You've started now word of mouth. Where, where am I going to go for dinner now? If I like Chili's, I'm going to... And I'm going to do what? I'm going to try and round up as many people that I can lasso in the go in at the same time so that I can A, be mayor, B, get my t-shirt, and C, get a discount. I know, we're, I know we're right at time. If you can stay, and I know many people have to go, if you can stay for another 10 minutes, then I'm committed to stay for another 10 minutes. I'd like to talk a little bit more about this stuff. Is this making some sense? Is, is this a little less maybe overwhelming or intimidating than perhaps you thought before you walked in the door? No, you had a comment. What were you going to yeah, say? Yeah, the four, with just the knowledge, the four square, how about when you look at your Facebook and they say, you know, check in, that's not four square. You have to have the app. Yes, when you, so yes, exactly. So um, four square is integrated, but you can also just check into a, lo like when it says location, like, right. you know, I'll put, I just I landed at O'Hare. Right. And it'll say, you know, do you right. want to add the location? And it uses, you know, essentially GPS off of the device that you're using. Yeah. But that's exactly it. Now I know why some, my son uses Foursquare. <laughs> yes, exactly. And now, you know, and nobody woke up one day and said, you have to use Foursquare. Your, your performance is going to be rated on Foursquare. People are getting rewarded. And to Marianne's point, to Marianne's point, different people have different motivations. Some people want the status, I want to be mayor, right? They want to be visibly mayor. I want to show up on Facebook, I am the mayor of Chili's in Wheaton. I'm not. But I, you know, I want to show up as the mayor of, of Chili's in Wheaton. People want, you know, and I want my 476 Facebook friends. I don't really have 476 Facebook friends. No, I don't have um, But, uh, you know, and I want people to see that. Or in Mary Ann's case, it's not so much the status, I'm playing because I want the prizes. I want the prizes, yeah? So how can you use game mechanics instead of telling people we're gonna do this, actually have them experience it in a way where they're motivated to want to learn it rather than feeling like they're being pressured or forced into it, right? Yeah, no. So the question, so if you were in a, you know, you're in a company, you're doing a training, you want to use the game, it is, do you use it in class or do you, is this something you send out before they get to class, you know, go to, you know, look up in Evernote? I, I'm thinking, it, you know, I'm just thinking, do you do it in class or do you want them to look on their cell phones? How would, how can the companies use it? It's a, that's a fabulous question. Let's take a very specific example. Hold on. I think you talked about this SharePoint training that you've yes. got to add over by March 15th. Mm -hmm. So when IT rolls out a new technology like SharePoint, how many people are using SharePoint in their organizations today, right? Right? What we want is adoption. We want people to actually use the new tools. So instead of telling people in 700 email messages that say, hey, SharePoint is coming on March 15th, and you guys better use it, otherwise the IT department's going to come visit your desk and take away your network drive, what if we did a scavenger hunt that was a photo-based scavenger hunt, right? So they did screenshots, and they had to go out to SharePoint and actually go look up things in a help file and go discover things, and what if you gave them prizes? What kind of prizes? Do you have to give them cards like Oprah? No. Badges? Badges! You can give them badges, you can give them candy, you can give them Sharpie markers. Everybody loves a Sharpie. And let me tell you, Sharpies go over big in global audiences. When I give away Sharpies in the Middle East and Asia, people go crazy because they don't have access to that. They don't have access to those American products in the same way that, you know, we do here because we're in the United States. Post-it notes are another big thing. So we're not talking about, like, you know, thousands of dollars in prizes. We're talking about stationary, really. Um, you know, I think about some of the vendors that have given me, anybody ever get the cool little books and it's got the page flags and the post-it art? Am I going too much of a paper geek here? Am I, right? You know, like, who doesn't love a... A tchotchke. A tchotchke! A button. I'm mayor of SharePoint, right? <laughs> This is why, like, when we voted in the election, regardless of, you know, independent of politics, when we voted, what did they give you after you voted? I voted! Because then you want to run I voted. I'm the 
the mayor of this particular place, of this particular place. So we could do, what else could Paula do with gamification in helping to get people not only to learn how to use SharePoint quickly, but also like it? Maybe. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things, so SharePoint is often used as a centralized place to post files and other information for teams to organize. Sometimes we use it as the backbone of a new intranet. So all right, so what does good look like? Good would look like A, people know how to navigate the site, right? So then you would come up with activities where they would win prizes for demonstrating that they know how to navigate the site. Marilyn. One of the things that SharePoint does when you, you get your team together, you can put your picture up. And so you could have people uh, get their pictures up on SharePoint with a little blurb about who they are and what they do. And people love their own publicity. Yeah. They do. That's self-promotional. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And then they could do that, right? And then you could you could observe, right, that they've done it, or you could have them actually just do a you know a screenshot that they actually posted that to the you know their profile in SharePoint, and then throw it into a, an Evernote folder, right? And then announce, just send out an email. So to your point, Norma, do you do it in the classroom or can you do it outside of the classroom? Oh, depends yeah. on your design. It depends on you know what it is. There's something about being here and running together. How many people in you know, in learning something new about your device today, learn from somebody else in the room. Right? I didn't tell you to go learn from this person or go to learn from that person. You just, you figured it out because you were motivated to do it. Tons of technology and tools out there. Matt's got some fabulous stuff. I just love the improv. How can we make it fun? How can we make it engaging without feeling like, oh, geez, another software, really? They're a little tired too. Wow, am I going to come in for seven hours of SharePoint training? Mm -hmm. Do I have to, you know? Click next. How do we make it engaging so that people are motivated to learn? And how do we reward them for what good looks like? We got to get clear on what good looks like. That's part of the performance equation. All right. Last couple of things that I want to show you. Any questions? Do you understand why we did this activity? Can you apply it back to your job? Okay. Scavenger hunts. Scavenger hunts are really good for onboarding new employees, socializing new departments, team building, that kind of stuff. You got a department that's not um, getting along so well, perhaps, right? Or two departments not getting along so well? Give them activities to solve together and reward them for, for collaborating. Right? So dragging everybody into a room going, well, oh, guys, all right, you know, we need to. All right. Let me show you a couple more things. Before I forget, I'm going to tell you about this. I don't. Um, I collect email addresses because I like to keep in touch with people. I don't sell people's names to weird spam lists and mail lists and do wacky things with it. Um, but if you want to keep in touch with me and want to have access to this, this is the revised version of Bloom's Taxonomy. And what is Bloom's Taxonomy? What's that? Head, heart, hands. Head, heart, hands. So it's it's the it's the KSAs, right? How do we decide at what you know? Do people need to know something, or do they need to be able to do something? Bloom's taxonomy. At what level do they need to be able to synthesize? Do they need to be able to apply higher levels of order? This is the revised version of Bloom's. It's based on one of the um, graduate students that actually worked with Benjamin Bloom when he first created Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, when he first published, um, this grad student now went on and did seven years of research. Uh, and this is based on the new version of Blooms, which I, the old version of, the original version of Blooms was in the competency model, the ACD competency model. We're pretty sure the new version of Blooms will be in the new competency model. But look at this job, I love this. This is one of the takeaways that I got at Trinity Magazine. So we have a level one is remembering, just remembering something, right? So that's regurgitation or recitation, right? So the definition of it, what does remembering mean? And remembering was at the top. That's why I scrolled past it. But that's so then retrieving, recalling, or recognizing knowledge from memory. What are activities that you can do that will support remembering? Uh, 
Writing learning objectives, yeah. And then now writing learning objectives, because we should use keywords that speak to that level. If we want somebody to be able to do something or perform, we want people to be able to navigate SharePoint, then my learning objective should not be, by the end of this course, <laughs> you will know how to navigate SharePoint. <laughs> Who cares if you know? We need you to do it. And we need you to show that you do it, all right? So the higher order of things, and then here's the other cool thing. It not only talks about the different activities that are here, talks about the different open source technologies and free tools like an Evernote you can use to drive this. So we go from remembering up to understanding. Understanding to applying. This is where skills begin. Before this, we're not talking about skills. Right? Can you give us this website? Yeah, it's a it's PDF file. Send me, send me an email. Send me an email and I'll send this to you. And I'll put my email address up over here. It's a. Uh, is that part of the scavenger hunt? That's right. <laughs> it's my name, and then it's my company. It's Owls O W L S, and then a hyphen. Sorry, guys, on that side of the room. O W L S Owls, and then a hyphen. Ledge L E D. GE.com. Yule in German means wise old owl. My mother came up with the name of the company. She had a company, she named it Owl Sledge. My little owl logo, some of you have seen it, and it's on those. I love the sewing kit. Thank you, the sewing kit inside the luggage stack. So that was my brother's idea. It's working for me. Thank you. Yeah, sewing kit. There's a real needle and thread and a button and all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right, so speaking of scavenger hunts, and this is where we're gonna go ahead and end for today. And again, uh, also if you send me an email, oh, you know what, CCSTD, we'll have um, CCSTD go ahead and just send out this slide deck as a PDF file, right? Yeah, Wordle. Yeah, yeah, Wordle. Yeah, we did this the last time I presented at CCSTD. So here's just an idea about some game mechanics. We talked about most of these. Game mechanics, just an idea in a Wordle which is just a cool little word graphic, visual, better than looking at a bulleted list, something with color, a little bit of flow, a little bit of interesting structure to it. This is John Chen. John Chen's in Seattle. He's a former Microsoft guy. He's with Microsoft for 10 years. I don't remember how many patents John has with Microsoft. That's me, we were Skyping. We actually, um, we've been running scavenger hunts and goose chase together with learning professionals worldwide since May. We're gonna do a big one with the International Conference in Dallas this year. So May 19th is when the conference starts. May 19th through May 22nd in Dallas is the City Conference. Everybody will be able to play regardless of where you are in the world for prizes and points. You have to complete missions. It's a photo evidence hunt. So you have to complete missions. Um, and the missions will be based on the competency model. So you'll have to show that you can demonstrate some of the things in the competency model, right? Uh, and uh, there's a tool for that. There's an app for that, which I'll show you in just a second that you can play with. There's an app for that. Um, so uh, the way to find out about the hunt is going to be to you know connect with me in some kind of way. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you don't necessarily have to follow me or become friends with me, but you're going to have to watch for the information. We'll start sending out information on how to play in uh, early May. We'll start sending it out. Um, so the reason why John is involved is John actually just uh, came out with a brand new book. It's from Wiley & Sons, 50 Digital Team Building Games, How You Can Leverage Technology. Right? Specific examples, most of the tools that John uses in here are free, including Goose Chase. <coughs> which is what we use in order to drive this particular goose chase or scavenger hunt. And uh, we'll go ahead and raffle this off and, or do a drawing for this in just a second. Um, and there is an app for this. So there's the book. John's the CEO of a company called Geoteaming. Um, John just did an event with two pharmaceutical companies where they rented out the uh, sports stadium for Arizona State University and spent the day with 2,000 people actually completing amazing race activities within the stadium. 
And the reason why they did it, when John and his team uh, work together with a new client, they talk about what organizational outcomes are you trying to achieve. And these two pharmaceutical companies had partnered, and they have this new drug that's coming out, uh, and they needed their salespeople to be able to you know, work together, to actually have a conversation and collaborate. So again, instead of dragging everybody in, going, OK, guys, well, here's the 17, you know, here's the 1,700 slides of why we need you to work together, they actually put them into an experience that had them do that. One of the activities was actually using one of those t-shirt launchers. Oh. And the activity was they had to get it you know, up a certain number of you know, rows within the stand. And we don't all necessarily have access to that. But we can do things like at Denver, at, at ASCD International Conference, we were in Denver last year. And we had people doing some silly stuff. You had to make a, you had to make a pirate hat. But you had to make a pirate hat out of one of the newspapers from the Global Village, which is where all the people outside of North America hang out that Americans never go into. We wanted people to go into the global village. We wanted people to know it was OK. So we made them go get newspapers. And they had to talk to somebody in the global village to figure out where the newspapers were. And then they had to make a pirate hat. And they had to take a picture of most of the team members wearing a pirate hat and then post it to the scavenger. So you can do silly things again. But we have to be clear on what do we want them to be able to do. And Goose Chase, this is the app. So it looks like this. Goose Chase, you can download it. It's available on Android. It's available. You have to have. Android or uh, iOS, either an iPhone or an iPad, in order to use Goose Chase to play. You solve missions for points, the more missions you solve. And we give you so many missions that you have to be strategic in thinking about which, which missions are going to be worth you spending your time on. If you come to the conference, we're also going to do what's called geocaching, which means we're going to hide prizes in the expo wall. So last year, for instance, we hit prizes with Bob Pike and with Tiagi. So the first person out of all the teams that were playing who went to the booth got a stack of DVDs or an hour of coaching with you know Lou Russell and an assessment. I mean, you know, so we're geocaching. So when people show up and talk to the petty cash window woman in accounting, maybe you get a prize. It's another way on top of the points, right, to be the first one there. And we didn't tell them where the prices were geocached. We didn't tell them where the sort of Easter eggs were hidden. We just had people go out and sort of figure it out. And there's a leaderboard in Goose Chase. You solve things, and then you can see the leaderboard and see what your ranking is and go, oh my goodness, the game's going to end at 4.30. But I need to get more points. How do I get more points? Questions? I know what I'm asking you guys to do. We're transforming a profession. It's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> we got to slight the sacred cows, right? We got to, the stuff that's not serving us, we got to get rid of it. It's got to go. Be fearless. It doesn't mean, being fearless doesn't mean not being afraid. It means being afraid of doing it anyway. Learn through failure. Go out and try it. Try it again. <laughs> so a friend of mine and his nephew, this was Christmas, right? The kid was, Will was so excited with his costume that Uncle Hal put a costume on too. Right? Don't be afraid. Go on and play. We can do this together. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs>